It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. This year, 2018, marks 40 years since the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints began once again to ordain black members of African descent to its priesthood. 40 years since the church began administering its sacred temple ordinances to black women and men. Over the past 40 years, the body of scholarship on race and the church has expanded, with the biggest advances happening over the past 10 years. Max Perry Mueller's book is one of the latest offerings. It's called Race and the Making of the Mormon People from the University of North Carolina Press. And Mueller joins us to talk about it in this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. He's assistant professor of religious studies at the University of Nebraska. And we recorded this interview last year when he visited the Institute to talk about the book. Questions and comments can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. And if you value this program, please take a moment to rate and review it in iTunes or share it with a friend. Max Perry Mueller joins us today on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thanks for being with us, Max. Thanks for this opportunity. Glad to be here. And you're joining us from the University of Nebraska. You're out here in Provo, kind of on a little book tour, talking about the new book that just came out. That's correct. And the book is called Race and the Making of the Mormon People. I wanted to start out by talking to you about why this book came about. The first line in your book makes your goal clear. You say, this is a study of race and how Americans write about it. Of course, You've become one of the Americans writing about race yourself. So what's your background? Um, So, yeah, um, how do I – let me answer this in two two ways. So this book allows me to examine two parts of my personal history, as is the case with many historians and scholars, influences my professional history. So um, I was born in Wyoming, Casper, Wyoming, in fact, along the the Mormon Trail, so to speak. And um, actually that was a really important – time in my life. I spent the first six years of my life in Wyoming, in Casper. And my parents, and this is a little bit confessional, but my parents split acrimoniously when I was quite young. And my mom, my my parents were kind of uh, post-hippie hippies living on Casper Mountain um, (laughs) and built their own house. And I have kind of fond memories of this kind of a house with uh, with a big greenhouse, they were going to grow their own food, just really kind of off the grid living um, before it became kind of more popularized in the kind of modern day um, back to the land movement. Anyway, parents split and my mom and I moved to town and across the street uh, was a large uh, Mormon family. And it was still a very tense time for me. My parents were still working their relationship out. In fact, it was... uh, there was certainly a lot of acrimony in the home and nothing violent, but it was not a, not a pleasant time for me. And so I often would go across the street and find in that home uh, playmates and um, kind of a loving atmosphere that really contrasted with the, the, my home life, which was uh, pretty tumultuous. And that Mormon family treated me as one of their own. They recognized, I think, looking back, that I was a kid in need of a place to go that was safe and, um, and welcoming and loving. And they even always had a, had a place set out for, for me at, at dinner time. And I got a really, this was when I was four and five, I got a sense of the Mormon home life. You know, that, that experience really endeared me to the Mormon people. Um, not a not a great sense of necessarily the theology, though certainly the theology informs the the Mormon home life. So Mormons have have a place in my heart because of that experience. At the same time, I was also interested in I wasn't a Mormon, right? And I was interested in and and I recognized that the Mormons too were a people, even in a place like Casper in the West, set apart. They were a group that was both very fully American, but also different than American. You know, we might use words like, and I, words that I would use today is kind of like a white ethnic group, right? A very, a, a group that has a, a particular um, sense of self, uh, some sometimes described as insular. Shared history. Uh, a shared yeah. history. And so I was always fascinated by by these people that were both so, so, so familiar, even for me, as I said before, kind of family, but who are different than me and different than other Americans. So that was really an important aspect. I'll even, I'll note one other thing. Once I left uh, Wyoming without meaning to, I continued to be fascinated with Mormons and it took the shape or, and I, get, I continue to learn about Mormons 
even as a young kid, and that took the shape of the Great Brain books. Do you know the Great Brain <laughs> yeah. books? So yeah, I do. The Great and in a lot of ways, that was to me. Uh, I think that actually sparked my interest in history, especially hmm. 19th century and early 20th century history. So if you don't know the Great Brain books, it um, it's a series of books, a you know what early chapter books, right? So. Uh, elementary school age. It's like a more basic Nancy Drew. Kind of Nancy mystery, Drew books. Like and he's solving stuff. Exactly, exactly. So the narrator is the younger brother of this, the great brain, a, a precocious young man who is always getting himself into scrapes. But it takes place in southern Utah in a made up city, but I think it's Cedar City in real life. I think that's where the author was from. But this family were um, ca the only Catholic family in town in a very, living in a very predominant uh, Mormon community. So kind of on the edges of this narration are key parts of, of Mormon uh, culture, particular religious b uh, beliefs and practices, uh, relationships with Native Americans, the ZCMI, all of these things. Um, so I was always fascinated with that kind of insider and outsider dynamic in terms of Mormonism. Also, just again, kind of confessionally a, a little bit, my, my, my mom's second family, uh, my mom has been married and this one's going to stick. She's on her third marriage. But my, my mom's second uh, marriage was to a man who had older children. Um, and one, uh, and he had adopted this, uh, this man had adopted children and who are of mixed race. And one of their, one of the children is a guy named Jason Rothenberg, um, now known as Jason Rays. And he was really my only, I, I'm an only child. And he uh, was, so for a very short period of time, I was in sixth and seventh grade, and he was a junior and senior in high school. We lived together. And um, incredibly talented guy. In fact, he was the first uh, adult Simba in The Lion King on mm -hmm. the first Broadway performance. And that helped – in some ways, his racial ambiguity helped him get that role besides, of course, his immense talent. Uh, he, he was also Pontius Pilate and Judas on the national tour of Jesus Christ Superstar. So – when, and we would follow him around for tours uh, while he was on the East Coast where we, we lived. But anyway, while he was living in, at home, I watched Jason struggle with his uh, racial identity in a very small upstate New York town where he was way too talented and way too different in a lot of ways for this small community. A, you know, light skinned guy, but had very kind of stereotypical, you know, black hair. And obviously all the politics around hair is really important. So I watched him try to relax his hair to make it kind of, uh, you know, quote unquote, whiter, straighter. And he eventually changed. He also, his last name was Rothenberg. Yeah. So, so uh, Jewish last name, even though kind of we were at that point, you use, <laughs> which is where a lot of uh, Unitarian, Universalist, Unitarian so. Universalists go, but he wanted, he was really, I saw him struggling with his own identity in, in, a, in a world that really didn't know how to understand him uh, and the complex nature of his identities. And he went on to great success with the, uh, the Lion King and had some roles on Disney movies, um, but he ended up taking his own life. Um, in 2004. And um, so the book is that actually dedicated to him. With the, I say all this because with the, both the Mormons and watching, my, watching Jason, I was, these are people that were at once family to me, but also I was very different from. So they were both other to me. And um, I think that really informs why I'm interested in putting these conversations about initially why I put these conversations about race and Mormonism together, um, though once you start diving in to the history of Mormonism, race emerges as a real central uh, aspect of Mormon history. Is there any drawback to that kind of personal connection? Perhaps. <laughs> but I think fundamentally that's what we do as religious studies scholars and hopefully as historians. We try at our best to understand people who are different than this is what i tell my students is that my goal is to teach them to understand people uh, who are different from you who have different views and beliefs and practices on their own terms right so i i hope that my personal history informs that those goals anyway one thing that's interesting is you yeah. don't mention that in your prefatory material you yeah. you was that a conscious choice not to mention your own situatedness or even your yeah. race for example yeah i mean <laughs> I even debated whether or not to out myself as a non-Mormon. I mean, I, I, I'm white. I'm heterosexual. I was born in the West. Mm -hmm. I'm married. There, you know, we yeah, I joke so about this. Yeah, there's so many identities in yeah, there. Exactly. And you the, just don't. 
yeah, 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 but I also those are those are signifiers of Mormonists in some ways, mm-hmm. right? Stereotypical mm-hmm. Mormonists. I kind of hint at my non-Mormon status in my in my acknowledgments of of the book. Um, that's my way. I, but I actually debated whether or not how do I situate myself mm. explicitly, as we all are. We're uh, easily searchable online. So I didn't think that was necessary to include in the text. One can find me in my writings. I've written about Jason, uh, my stepbrother, in my, actually my review of the Book of Mormon. The musical. The musical, which is a play off of The Lion King. It's a very specific play off mm-hmm. of The Lion King trope. Using racial tropes. Especially the racial yeah. tropes and also the, the styles of it. I mean, the Akuna Matata song, mm-hmm. which they have a particular mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> scatological yes. version of the Akuna Matata <laughs> song in the Book of Mormon. And so, um, but my experience with Jason growing up as, you know, both studying M- Mormons or being fascinated by Mormons and musicals certainly informed my views on the Book of Mormon musical. So yeah, I mean, of course, uh, I, I think there's more benefit to my personal experiences than um, drawbacks, I would say. Um, Do you see any limitations though? For example, one of the things I'm thinking about is when you're talking about African Americans and African American history or, or Native American or American Indian history, which you do in this book quite a bit, mm-hmm. you are coming at it from that sort of white American mm-hmm. background as well. And people that, uh, People of color, for example, see another white person talking about people of color. Yeah, and I'm, that is, I'm sure perhaps we'll talk a little bit about, more about this uh, later in the interview, but I'm very conscious, I hope in the book, but certainly in my responses around the book and p- promoting the book and thinking about the book, about the, my limitations, that this is not my history, mm-hmm. right? Um, I'll say this right from the beginning, I guess, uh, that I... I'm going to use the word. I love Jane Manning James. I admire Jane Manning James, one of these central figures of, uh, of, my, of my book, this really singular, literally <laughs> singular, and also metaphorically singular figure in Mormon history, this convert uh, from Connecticut who moves her whole, converts her whole family and moves them to Nauvoo to join up with uh, and lives with Joseph Smith for, and, 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 and his household for a time, becomes a confidant to Joseph Smith and his family, then moves to Utah uh, as, a, as a part of the 1847 or wave. So she's a, one of the key, you know, she's a member of that most revered class of, uh, of pioneers and lives in Salt Lake until 1908 in her death and has a very interesting, relation, very complex relationship with the rest of the Mormon people in the building up of Zion as she is both a storehouse of memories of the time of Joseph's life and clearly has demonstrated her, and she believes her true, true Mormonist, but she's also a black woman who at that, at the end of her life, as we'll perhaps talk about, uh, belonged to a church that no longer, no longer wanted necessarily to have her at least as a full member of, of the, of that community. Which we'll talk about the unusual changes that uh, that Mormonism went through that uh, they were unexpected to Jane. That's Max Perry Mueller. We're talking with him today about his book, Race and the Making of the Mormon People. Let's set the stage, Max. Mormonism was born in the 19th century. Church was officially established in 1830. And before we dig into Mormon ideas about race, let's give us a bird's eye view quickly about race in America, Mormonism's broader context. Sure. I'm going to, I'll talk a little bit about 1830, but before I do, I want to kind of set the stage uh, briefly about race and America and the American project in, in, in two concrete ways. Well, I'll start with the story of Native Americans first. So during the age of exploration, so starting in the uh, uh, 1400s, early 1500s and in the 1600s. Wait, am I to understand that America existed at that time? (laughs) It existed. Uh, So famously, infamously, Columbus sails. The ocean blue. Sails the ocean blue, sails west trying to get to India. Recognizes the earth is round. So if you circumnavigate, you'll actually end up on the other side of what was understood as the the landmass of the world, which was Europe, Africa, and Asia, right? And he wanted to get to the other side of Asia so he could establish trade routes with the Indians. And in India. In India, right. In India. Indian Indians. But on his way west, he runs into some islands, not actually uh, right. the, 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 uh, Continental the continent. States, yeah. He runs into some islands that weren't supposed to be there. Soon he figures out that there's a huge landmass, uh, a whole continent that isn't supposed to be here. Uh, and the reason it's not supposed to be here in some ways is biblical. 
right? Christopher Columbus is in some ways an early modernist. He has he's using scientific technology about about understandings that the world is the the planet is round. He's using the stars to n navigate the oceans, etc. Um, but at the same time, Christopher Columbus, like uh, many early modernists, uh, explorers, believe that the Bible is history, and the, especially in terms of ju uh, distribution of humanity. The basic story of humanity, according to the Bible, is that we have our first family, Adam and Eve, and they fall <laughs> rather quickly, and they have generations, a few generations, a few generations, and that soon fall further and further away from uh, God's will until God says, hey, I want to start over with humanity. This humanity project isn't going so well. So he says, Noah, since you are faithful, wise in your generation, uh, Noah, I'm telling you, I'm going to send a flood. So get your family. Build the arky arky. Build the arky arky. Yeah. Get everybody, get all your family on board. Everyone laughs at him, laughs at him. You know, this is pu uh, puppycock. Uh, anyway, the flood does come, destroy, according to the Bible, destroys the, all of humanity, except those who have survived on the flood. And so we have the, and after the flood waters recede, we have Noah starting the second first family of humanity, his progeny and the progeny of his, his, his sons. And we have, in particular, uh, we have three sons, Ham, Japheth, and Shem. And an event happens that's described in the book of Genesis after, after the flood in which – Just Noah gets drunk and then they – Noah gets yeah. drunk. It's kind of – It's ambiguous. It's very ambiguous exactly what happens. The, yeah. the, there's a lot of midrash from the early rabbinical sources that have very colorful expl explanations of exactly what transpired. Anyway, Noah gets drunk, goes into his tent, is apparently disrobes and – Ham goes in and laughs at Noah, and Japheth and Shem cover up their father. And they like walk in backwards. And they walk in backwards, backwards so they don't see his nakedness, yeah. right? And Noah wakes up and he's upset <laughs> with his son Ham for laughing at him, and he Levy's says, "There's a curse upon him." Then there's a curse not upon him, upon his descendants. Sims, yes, generations. Uh, generations curse upon yours. So uh, curse upon not about on Ham, but on Canaan in particular, his his son. And they will have to be servants of servants of the other two more faithful sons and their descendants, Japheth and Shem. Okay, the, the drama moves forward and the understanding is Ham's progeny fill up, populate Africa. Japheth populates Europe and Shem populates the Near East and Asia. And that is the a biblical understanding of the world's people, world's people, right? And that is taken not as kind of mythos, but history. And part of the age of explorations is actually re racializing the text that actually has isn't clear what the that the curses actually demarcate a uh, relate to a racial curse. Um, actually, we've we historically have read the race into those those sources that aren't necessarily clear, and we've read them to justify eventually sl slavery. So. Anyway, Christopher Columbus gets and discovers there are people, there are land, and who are these people? They're not supposed to be here. How do they fit into the biblical distribution of humanity? I call this the crisis of discovery. And yeah, got to fit it into the story. Got to fit it into the story. And so, from popes to Puritans to early other early colonialists have always tried to figure out who are. Are these people that are misnamed Indians, Native Americans, and how do they fit into the biblical distribution of humanity? Eventually comes the consensus comes, and this was actually took a while to get to it, that these are actually humans. They're not animals. And therefore they deserve to be, to have the opportunity to be Christianized. That's key. And that's actually what the Pope, uh, I forget which Pope it is, uh, in, a, in, a, in a papal degree in uh, 1537, the, uh, the Pope um, says, hey, you can't enslave these people. These are not animals. You have to allow them to be, they have souls and therefore they are um, eligible to be saved and, and human agency. Anyway, so that sets in motion the idea of a long process of religious Catholics, Protestants, and eventually Mormons to other religious groups uh, attempting to Christianize, civilize Native Americans. Fast forward <laughs> to 1830 when Mormonism begins. That process 
at least according to the missionaries and then the uh, the early col- colonialists and then the and then the very young United States and less so New France and other colonial powers in, in, in America have given up on that project. The fact that Native Americans have rejected, by and large, in the mass, civilizing attempts, the civilizing attempts yeah. is a sign of their innate savagery. So it's not that the, the uh, an idea that they could be made with proper paternalistic Christian care into believing Christians by the fact that they've rejected the gospel through indifference and often through uh, violent uh, resistance points to the understanding of an innate savagery, right? These are unredeemable. So Andrew Jackson establishes the Indian Removal Act, believing that there, that the Indian cannot be an American. He's on the $20 bill. The $20 bill. Well, he's the guy who hopefully not for too let's much hope, longer. Yeah. But this is um, what he does. They, they're removing the Indians from the country. They're point. removing the Indians like, from the country. We're not going to help you. You're... We're separating. We're separating you. Mormons you cannot like, be a part of it. Our... But Mormons. But but didn't... Mormons yeah. actually. So enter the Mormons at this time. And the Mormons, uh, a few things are really interesting, especially with the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon fills out, and this is true with a lot of Mormon scriptures, fill out gaps in, in the, uh, the biblical history, fill out lacunas in biblical history. So the Book of Mormon is an answer, a very clear answer, a very long answer, a 600-page answer to the question, who are Native Americans? And the Book of Mormon isn't unique in this speculation, which they don't say speculate. The Book of Mormon doesn't say it's speculation, but actually historical fact. But the the Book of Mormon says, actually, these are actually lost tribes of Israel. They are uh, the most favored branch of uh, the Abrahamic. They are the part of the Abrahamic. Right? They're, they're descendants of Shem and by, by descent, Abraham. A group of a family, again, a family who have been told by God to flee Israel before the conquering of of. Uh, Israel by the ba- uh, Babylonians to leave and head into the wilderness and to establish there a uh, a godly kingdom, right? And this is the story of the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon unfolds, therefore, uh, this almost millennium, millennia long history of what happens to this family. And in it, what is very important to our conversation today in it, we have very early on in this history, a split, a split that becomes racialized. And what happens is one part of this family, Lehi's family, Laman and Lamuel, sin against, and this is how race begins to in biblical texts too, although it's less explicit. This is how families, the, the human family separates. One branch of the human family rises up against, sins against another family. Yeah, you had Cain killing Abel. Cain and this killing Abel. Laman and Lamuel trying to kill Trying, Nephi. murmuring against, trying yeah. to kill uh, Nephi. Exactly. For which they are cursed and set apart, marked off, saying that they are less, uh, are an inferior branch of, the hu- uh, of that human family, of that particular human family. And the Book of Mormon's history is a very complex story about the relationship between the Nephi, the Nephite people, the people who stay more or less, and this is complicated, faithful to um, the traditions, the faith of their forefathers, and the Lamanites, who are this branch that had sin, uh, raised up and sin, sinned against Nephi and his, and his family. And we'll talk more about how that plays out and how Mormons interpreted the Book of Mormon. But before we do that, it, it's your whole first chapter, really, yep. an in-depth analysis of the Book of Mormon, both what the book itself says and then also what its first readers drew out of the Book of Mormon. So what's interesting is you begin with a plea with readers and scholars to take the Book of Mormon more seriously. Even by Latter-day Saints, a lot of scholars have said early Mormons saw the Book of Mormon as a sign of Joseph Smith prophethood. They didn't really take an in-depth look at its theology. It didn't uh, impact too much of of Latter-day Saint theology. It served more as a sign. You're pushing back on that idea. You're directly challenging that idea Mm -hmm. in this book. Yes, absolutely. Well, a a couple of points to make on why I think clearly the Book Book of Mormon had an impact on theology and history, uh, which are intertwined. So the Book of Mormon has a, has, 
records a history, but also it, it records a past and then it prophesizes about a future. And so the Book of Mormon for its earliest adopters, this, these, these white Americans who they believe themselves at least initially to be Gentiles, mandates them, mandates these people to whom the Book of Mormon would be first, the Book of Mormon says it explicitly will be first uh, restored to bring the history back to the, this history's actual real owners, which are the descendants of the Lamanites now the people they call uh, Americans called Indians or, or we call uh, more often Native Americans. So the first official mission, and if there's nothing more Mormon than a, a more, a missions, the first official mission in Mormon history was Joseph, uh, uh, Joseph Smith sent some of his most important lieutenants. And this is in eight, at the end of 1830. So within a, not even a year into the history, he's willing to use some of his most precious assets uh, and, and, and collaborators to send them west, to go and bring this gospel eventually to actually the people who had just been forced west because of the Indian Removal Act. Um, and he sends them west, a group of people, including Parley P. Pratt and others, Oliver Cowdery and uh, other really important senior fi figures. Oliver Cowdery was the second. Scribe of the Book of Mormon. Uh, scribe, scribe of the Book of Mormon. Mormon. I say in yeah. the book, uh, arguably Oliver Cowdery knows the Book of Mormon better than Joseph Smith himself. Um, so really important figures. He says, all right, I'm going to use you all and you're going to go west and you're going to bring this book to the Lamanites and restore it to them. And they target, uh, eventually they end up targeting a, a, a community of Delaware just on the other side of the Kansas or Kaw River in what, um, which was then Indian country, but now was in Kansas. So just on that fact alone, right, that they're reading closely, clearly the, the church leaders are reading closely and taking that mandate directly, which is very clear from the Book of Mormon, seriously, and they're willing to expend energy and resources to bring about that mandate. So that's that I think is very important. It's and almost like those scholars, by the way, are sort of looking at how Early Mormons weren't using the Book of Mormon in the same way that Mormons today use it and sort of translated that into the idea of they weren't using the Book of Mormon, where you're, you're saying that these missions to the Lamanites and the ways that Mormons thought about American Indians signaled uh, that they thought deeply about. I mean, Parley P. Pratt, his autobiography makes clear that this was first and foremost in his mind and how the Book of Mormon would operate. Yes. I mean, he was concerned even before his conversion about the, f the fate of nat native, native peoples. Um, so is Eliza R. Snow. I mean, these are the reasons in some ways they cite their uh, – so, I mean, interestingly enough, some of the most important early converts, most famous early converts are drawn to Mormonism because of Mormonism's interest in redeeming – and we'll use language, Mormon language – restoring Native mm -hmm. Americans to their tr knowledge of the truth, their, their true selves. I was fascinated to see Eliza Snow had written poetry about this, it, as you said. About, beforehand. Yeah, yep. before she even had encountered the Book of exactly. Mormon. This was on her mind. So, And this gets back to racial – questions of racial fixity. Uh, and, and we're still talking mostly about Native Americans. So again, we move from early American colonists, explorers, views that their divine mandate is to – bring the sons of the forest <laughs> to civilize them because of the failures of that project and of which the colonists blamed on the Native Americans, not on their, not on their, on their own work. Uh, so racial fixity helped pro created uh, national policy on Native Americans. Native Americans cannot be because of their – They're diametrically opposed to our way of life and exactly. they cannot be converted to it. Exactly. Therefore, so we're going to move them west. And get rid of them. All right. Well, the Book of Mormon actually tells of the – certainly the tells of the, the descent into savagery of these same peoples, right? So it, share some assumptions. Shares mm -hmm. very, very similar assumptions. But the main – what I argue is the main racial theology of the Book of Mormon is not one of racial fixity but of racial redemption. Rest or, and, and I'll use the word again, racial redemption or the possibility of it. That race is not fixed. Race is not of divine design, but of the result of human failing, right? It's the idea that humans, and this gets into Mormon ideas of agency, which are very, very important, humans sinned against, against their family, which created these racial lines, lineages, and, and certain ra lineages are saddled by the sins of their forefathers. But because of human agency, even those who are saddled with those curses which manifest on uh, a skin but other uh, cultural signifiers can be redeemed can be restored if they accept the gospel 
right? That's the fundamental message of the Book of Mormon's racial theology, that even those who are cursed and set out, set apart from the rest of the human family, the white human family, and white more or less means race less, because race enters only into history. <laughs> yeah, you call it a white universalism, yes. but as you also note, white wasn't a thing. It was white isn't so th much. It was, it was the baseline good. <laughs> yes, it's the raceless race, yes, right? Yes, Though it's certainly, exactly. And, and only, you only get white <laughs> when you get non-white, mm -hmm. right? It's that contrast. Co-constructed, yep. yep. And the contrast creates the, the yep. two there. And by the way, just to interject, you sure. also point out how this plays out in the narrative of the Book of Mormon. Absolutely. One of your biggest points in this book is that the archives themselves are ra are racialized mm -hmm. and in some cases very racist in, yep. in excluding certain voices and yep. privileging other voices, primarily white voices mm -hmm. who are more often are literate or have control over archives or the ability to make records. You see this playing out in the Book of Mormon. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the main arguments of, of the book is that an archive is not simply a storehouse of documents, accumulation of documents. An objective over time. collection Ob objective, objective facts. Objective yeah. facts, uh, records of the past. But they are a storehouse. They are a place where race is actually made, where racial differences are actually written first, right? Racial differences are narrated first there and then get read onto bodies. So exactly like understandings of, take for example, the Book of Mormon, Right, book early Mormons viewing Native Americans as descendants of a cursed branch of Israelite, right? There, and where do they learn that lesson first? They didn't observe it on the bodies; they learned it from the text that they were reading, right? But also from that same text. And again, this goes back to your point that the Book of Mormon was actually you, or our point here that the Book of Mormon was actually being used, was that they believed that those. Cursed peoples could be redeemed if they were restored to the knowledge of their of their of their forefathers. There are a couple other kind of more historiographic points to make about what, how the Book of Mormon clearly was important, right? Scholars uh, scholars who say that the Book of Mormon wasn't used much uh, point to the fact that the Book of Mormon wasn't quoted in scriptures or sermons as much. All right, that's fair. Uh, I mean, I think but one of the reasons is that the, this new this new Mormon people are getting used to reading the Book of Mormon. These are biblical people first and foremost. So they're figuring out ways to uh, incorporate the the answers that the Book of Mormon provides to the biblical text into their their theology. But let me just give you so the Book of Mormon did not sell well, much to the chagrin of uh, its financial backers, the printer Joseph Smith himself. Although Joseph Smith didn't seem to be. I think too, too worried. Yeah, he didn't seem too sales-minded. He, he wasn't too worried. He was that. kind of done with the Book of Mormon in some ways, right? He moves on quickly to yeah. different translation processes. But anyway, other people are concerned. But the, the, that is, the, the, you know, how much was it? I forget how, exactly the early cost. It was expensive. And the, it wasn't like $13 or well, something Well, it like wasn't, that, it, was, it was a couple of dollars, but it was, that's. But I thought today's. it was the equivalent of like $50. Yes, it was very, very expensive like text. It was yeah. audacious printing press, right? P or printing production. Anyway, so it doesn't sell well. But there are other ways that the church broadcast the Book of Mormon. Right? They the would Book do Mormon. excerpts in newspapers. And, excerpts in newspapers. And a lot of so, them had to do with this redemption of the Lamanites. Exactly. Stuff. So the Evening and Morning Star, the church's first quasi-official, or maybe it is official, church newspaper, prints excerpts of the Book of Mormon. So there, and I read those as reading guides, teaching how a young Mormon people, right, or a, a people that are still being developed of their own sense of self and their relationship to this, this scripture should read the Book of Mormon. And a lot of it has to do with their, man, their, their mandate and their responsibility to, to, to create a new Jerusalem that, is, that will include Gentile populations and, most, and, and very importantly, a Lamanite or Native American populations that will be unified and create a covenantal community and then a covenantal city fit for Christ's return. That to me is pretty clear evidence that the Book of Mormon had a very clear, a very powerful impact on the early church's activities, its theologies, its printing operations. And again, this at a time when, so the Mormons are very much pushing back against the growing consensus that Native Americans and certainly African Americans and, and by extension, also in, in comparison, Euro-Americans, white Euro-Americans, these racial categories are fixed by biblical mandate, by political mandate, and increasingly by scientific 
mandate. At the same time that the Book of Mormon is... Pseudo-scientific pseudo, mandate. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Quote, unquote, big <laughs> quotation marks, scientific mandate. So um, ju- the same year that the Book of Mormon comes out, um, it's just kind of an amazing coincidence, Charles Caldwell, who's the f- founder of the University of Louisville uh, Medical School, produces his own lineage of uh, the racial uh, racial hierarchies, racial descriptions, where he says actually the ar- the archive that we should be looking to is not the biblical archive, but cra- and this is and he's not the first, but crania, right? To study the different sizes of skulls to determine who is on the higher to solidify the high- racial hierarchy. So the Mormons are pushing back against this idea of racial fixity coming from biblical or uh, theological sources, political sources, and quote, at big uh, quotation marks, scientific sources. So ironically, this church that is infamous, this community that is in, in non-Mormon circles, infamous for its, how about we say, problematic relationship to race, both specifically in terms of race, in terms of relationships with uh, African Americans, but having also, excluded black people uh, from the priesthood and temple for, exactly. until 1978. In so 1978, on, yeah. um, though, and it's important to point out, there was a period in time when that mm-hmm. was more and more in flux under Joseph Smith, uh, and even their complex relationships with Native Americans. That in the early days, these were in some ways moderately. And this is going to be kind of an oxymoron, maybe, but moderately radical in their views that race was something a schism within the human family that humans themselves could overcome through an acceptance of the new gospel and that the new gospel provided tools and actually examples, precedents of how racial schisms could be overcome in the past. That's Max Mueller. We're talking with him today about his book, Race and the Making of the Mormon People. Max, people are going to go crazy because there's so much that we could talk about, but uh, <laughs> but I want to keep moving. So they'll have to yep. pick up a copy of the book if they want yep, to dig exactly. more into that. Just to let people know, for example, you, you talk about how the early mission to the Lamanites wasn't very successful. And so Mormons had to look elsewhere for the fulfillment of, of these Lamanite blessings, how their identities as Gentiles originally began to shift. These uh, Latter-day Saints began to see themselves more as literally the descendants of the house of Israel and and having this believing blood that inclined them to accept the gospel. You talk about that. And you also talk about how Ham's descendants aren't actually mentioned in the Book of Mormon. And so there's this there's this absence there. And, and as Mormons were trying to figure out the place of black people, and that's kind of what I wanted to shift to right now. So in 1949, uh, the LDS Church's first presidency put out a statement to explain or defend the church's position on African Americans. So men were not allowed to hold the LDS priesthood, and women were not allowed to participate in LDS temple ceremonies. And the first presidency in 1949 said that this was the result of a direct commandment from the Lord, and and that this had been the case, quote, from the days of the church's organization. That's what the first presidency said. But more recently, the church has acknowledged an official approved scholarship that those things were inaccurate. Those claims weren't true. So how did the historical records then contradict that first presidency statement? Jane Manning James and Elijah Abel are two historical figures that directly challenge that line of thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that the nineteen that nineteen forty nine statement, um, and then thinking about what has come more recently, especially in the more in, in the last few years, has been is is, is is really quite interesting. But yes, so historians, let me let me let me jump ahead to the present a little bit, and especially around the change of that brought about the revelation the, uh, in in nineteen seventy eight that changed the the policy the. I would argue doctrine around people of African descent and their uh, ability to fully participate in some of the most essential parts of the the gospel, including priest, men holding the priesthood and men and women accessing the temple. Um, historians, historians were a huge part. Let's celebrate historians. Historians were a huge part in showing that actually ex- this exclusion was not always present in the church's history. So we can credit credit folks like Lester Bush in particular, Newell Bringhurst, uh, those two those two figures in, in particular are later folks like Armin Moss, um, but especially Lester Bush and, uh, and Newell Bringhurst, going to the sources. 
even in the church's own archives, to find examples, and the two most famous examples are Jane Manning James and Elijah Abel, of the church's, not, not just anybody, but the church's <laughs> founder, the founding prophet Joseph Smith, accepting Jane Manning James as a member of, of his household and perhaps even a member of his offering to accept her as a member of his eternal family and allowing Elijah Abel's ordination to, to be sustained and not objecting to uh, Elijah Abel's ordination based on idea that um, people of African descent were, for various reasons, excluded from access to the priesthood. So those two examples are really, those two people are really key to understanding um, that the early church was more, in terms of relationships with African Americans, more inclusive. Now, how does that fit into the Book of Mormon theology itself? And I and I and this is a little bit tough because, as you say, as we were talking about, the Book of Mormon uh, actually has no makes no mention of people of African descent. Ham's family is ha not in the story. Ham, Ham's family is not in the story. So we have Gentiles, kind of Japheth's family, and we have Shem, the and Lamanites, who will gather together and covenant together and create a new Jerusalem in the new world, according to the Book of Mormon. And Ham's family is, is, not, is not present. I think, well, I think that hints at a, a larger American understanding of this nation or, or ambivalence about the place of African Americans in this nation going forward related to issues around or, or, of slavery. What, what if we free the slaves? Um, will, can Afri I, I, not dissimilar to the questions around Native Americans, can African Americans be full members of this, of this national, national community? Um, so I think this Book of Mormon, where whenever it was written, <laughs> fits very much in the, into the main, the very intricate uh, and complex conversations around race, and even by exclusion of African Americans, hint at a position, a Mormon position on that question of whether or not African Americans can be a part of New Jerusalem, can be a part of the Amer this American project. And you said whenever it was written, one of the things you do in your treatment of the Book of Mormon is you don't affirm either way specifically uh, when the Book of Mormon is written. Obviously, there are people, members of the LDS Church and, and people that believe in the Book of Mormon as an ancient text or mm -hmm. historicity is so important. And then on the other hand, you have people who believe that it was a product of the 19th century completely, that Joseph Smith or someone else wrote it. And you kind of split that divide by not casting a judgment, but by by looking at the Book of Mormon uh, and, and saying, if it was a historical text, these Mormons were reading it that way in the 19th century, so you sort of try to see it through their eyes. Do you anticipate any criticism from people who thought you should have maybe identified the Book of Mormon as just a 19th century text? People who aren't Mormon, who don't have that kind of, uh, who don't, aren't looking at it through that lens. Did you anticipate criticism from that side of things? Like, hey, you're not hard on the Book of Mormon here. What's going on? Well, my response is twofold. I, uh, it's, it's, a, it enters into a uh, early 19th century moment um, and speaks directly to issues. Uh, you know, other other scholars have looked at how, uh, including its earliest critics and readers, look at how well it it answers all the major questions around baptism, about priesthood. Um, so a, a lot of people are reading the Book of Mormon very very carefully, right? So I mean, n not just the Mormons themselves, but especially Mormon detractors. Anyway, so how how well. How well suited it was to the not conversations around discussions around proper religious practices, ritual practices, ordination, baptism, et cetera, et cetera. And it also speaks to very much uh, the major debates around race in, in the time period. And yet the earliest readers, and this is my answer to, the, to, the, to that question, why not say it's a 19th, you know, produced in the early 19th century um, it's early, the earliest readers believed it to be an ancient text. And so we need to take to understand how they used it, read it, and then applied it, interpreted it, and how it uh, how they used those interpretations to uh, enact uh, history. Uh, we need to take that perspective seriously, that it is an ancient text that's that is both ancient but is speaking to the present, that is demanding of Mormons to do certain things. And I think that's the more important aspect, right? of the text. It's, a, it's, it's requiring them, if they believe it to be true, it's requiring them to take on certain actions. So that's my response, is that we need to, I mean, this is a basic tenet of religious studies, and, and I would hope other fields too, that we need to, when we're studying people, study them 
and appreciate their perspectives from their own terms, right? First and foremost, right? See the world through their eyes. So we understand how they're interpreting the world and how they're acting in it. So I think it would be unfair to the history because clearly that they're, they're reading it as an ancient text, but also an ancient text that's speaking to them at that particular moment. And I also don't think it would be fitting our best practices of our discipline to uh, render my own judgment on it. So that's kind of the way I, I understand it. That's Max Bueller. We're talking about his book, Race and the Making of the Mormon People. Max, I wanted to talk to you more about assessing Jane's records. She wrote this autobiography that's a, it's a fantastic document, but it was also filtered through a scribe. By the time that she recorded this, she had lost her eyesight and, and relied on a white scribe. And that scribe inserted things into the narrative that Jane didn't want to be part of her story. Talk about the difficulty of grappling with Jane's autobiography, given the fact that it was not given to a straight across. It, it came through someone else. Sure. Yeah. So the language here is interesting because she writes her autobiography, right? And in fact, she doesn't. She doesn't put pen to paper to narrate her life story. She re she turns to a, a white scribe, Elizabeth J.D. Roundy, to actually do the transcription of her autobiography. And this is, you know, I'll make two points. In some ways, and I do think actually one, 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 another, so I'll make, <laughs> I'll make three points. One, I do actually think Jane Manning James was literate in that she at one point could put pen to paper. I think at this point there is ample evidence and I discuss this at some length in my book, um, though other people have assumed, and I think that's a problem to assume that she was illiterate. There's plenty of evidence to point out that she was actually literate. So this is at the end of her life. So she's incap physically incapable of writing. This isn't, a, this is not an, uh, a loss of apt. This is not an absence of aptitude, but a, a loss of ability. And I think this is really important in terms of the kind of way we understand race uh, and literacy and the relationship between whiteness and, and literacy, the assumption that whiteness and literacy uh, go hand in hand. And this relates to other points. So Elizabeth Jane D. Roundy, sits down with Jane Manning James, started, probably starting in 1893, well, in Jane, about 15 years before Jane, Jane Manning James's death. And the purpose for Jane Manning James writing this autobiography, which it's titled A Life Sketch, it's not quite an autobiography uh, because Jane Manning James did not write it herself. And that's really an important aspect. So in, in, as I talk about in the book, Jane Manning James's life in some ways is a liminal life in that it crosses the boundaries between freedom and, and, and slavery. And so Elizabeth J.D. Roundy was actually seems like a pretty faithful scribe. She records in the first person James's life story and it, 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 her conversion to Mormonism in Connecticut, her amazing trek uh, to Nauvoo with her family members uh, that, whom she converted, her time in the Nauvoo Mansion House, which is very, very important to her. Uh, she gets to see the Yerman Thumb. She, she, she yes, exactly. Smith. She sees Joseph Smith's temple robe. She handles all these, all these sacred artifacts. So, sacred artifacts that are symbols of uh, the foundation of Mormonism. She was an early... And she's telling this while she's been excluded from the temple, which is exactly. now the sacred exactly. location she, of Mormonism. She even hints at... In, in, the, in the autobiography, she hints that she knows that, for example, new names are given in the temple. So she knows something about she, this. Yeah, she knows about the temple. She can't go there, but she's saying, I know about this. Exactly. And, I, and therefore, the implicit argument, therefore, is I should be able to go. I've proven my Mormonist. That's kind of the main argument uh, behind, I would argue, the polemic behind the autobiography. And you can say that because she'd also been writing to church leaders and petitioning exactly. them directly. I, exactly. I would like to do this. And they would say no. Exactly. So, yeah, J the autobiography is one document that we have, and again, not directly written by J James. And that's so important that it was actually, as I mentioned before, her, li her life crosses boundaries between slavery. You know, not freedom and freedom. I'm not going to quite call it slavery, but not freedom and freedom. But other, and, and her, 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 life, her life sketch parallels other slave narratives of really, inf or very famous slave narratives of the, of the 19th century, Frederick Douglass uh, in particular, who, for whom it was so important that they were, as Douglass says himself, written by myself, written by himself, right? To point out, this is my personal testimony, my, uh, my me directly adding 
with my pen to paper telling my story. And sadly, there would be white people in between those, right? They would need either a scribe or a person writing an introduction. Exactly. To validate. Like yeah. To validate. Yeah those those claims. So in some ways, James also needs this validation uh, from Elizabeth J.D. Roundy. So anyway, so... Uh, Not that there were any other, or very many other black people exactly. in Utah. Who, who could have could p- provided that, yeah. th- that, scri- that, th- that service. But anyway, interestingly, so Elizabeth Roundy seems to have no problem. She writes in the, f- records in the first person about these kind of fantastic things like she, Jane Manning James, heard, held the Urim and Thummim. She touched the temple robes. She was an early witness to uh, the secret days of polygamy. She says she was living with the Lawrence and Partridge sisters in the Nauvoo Mansion house when Joseph Smith was marrying them secretly. Um, and Jane Manning James says she condones this behavior uh, or the, this activity. Elizabeth, uh, she also, Elizabeth J.D. J. Roundy doesn't question the perhaps the most, one of the most interesting aspects of the life sketch, which is James claimed that she was offered to be spiritually adopted by the Smiths, which James says she refused and she re- which she regrets for the rest of her life because she didn't understand that that would have meant that a lowly black washer girl could have been elevated to the highest levels of heaven as the prophet and the prophet's family himself, which this whole autobiography, this whole letter writing campaign she engages in and the autobiography biography itself is an attempt to get into the temple so she can be sealed. She wants she, that rectified. She wants that rectified. Yeah. Anyway, so at the end of the, at the end of um, the, um, the life sketch, about 2,300 words. So very detail, detailed, rich, but quite short. Elizabeth J.D. Roundy has some questions that she wanted answered, especially about the paternity of Jane Manning James's eldest son, Sylvester James. And Sylvester James is a well-known figure in turn of the century Utah. He's a wealthy uh, landowner and is well respected, though he had actually event- had actually been excommunicated from the church, and. Elizabeth J.D. Roundy steps back from her role as faithful scribe and writes in her uh, in her first person that she wanted to ask Jane Manning James about the paternity of Sylvester. Because Sylvester wasn't mentioned by Jane. Sylvester is not mentioned by, uh, yeah. um, by Jane. And w- one can imagine in the conversations between scribe and and author here, why tell me about Sylvester. No, no, no. I don't want to tell you about Sylvester. In fact, Elizabeth J.D. Roundy says James evades questions about Sylvester's paternity, right? And so, so, so Elizabeth J.D. Roundy goes and um, asks Jane Manning James's brother Isaac about the true paternity of Sylvester, and and James uh, or Isaac provides the family gossip. He says that the father, the biological father, was a white man, a preacher back in Connecticut. And James had this child when she was young as a teenager. James and the young Jane Manning and this white preacher had some kind of encounter. And I choose my words carefully here because they're really important to think about what kind of encounter this was. The encounter eventually produced Sylvester. And this is one of the most challenging parts for me to write about here because contemporary Mormons, especially contemporary black Mormon women uh, for whom Jane Manning James has become truly a spiritual ancestor. And I hope, well, I'll say that. I'll, I'll editorialize. I, as a non-Mormon, I hope Jane Manning James's story becomes canonical and, and uh, for all Mormons because it's such, it's such a powerful story and it speaks to the history, complicated history of Mormonism. Beautiful, rich, powerful, faithful, and really heartbreaking too. Anyway, for these particular women, black Mormon women, look to Jane Manning James's story and in fact, reenact her life story. So they know the life story intimately. Uh, they reenact it for civic events and church events, right? They use her words. To, for, for, for them, her words have been canonical. And how they interpret this encounter between this white preacher and Jane Manning, Jane, Jane Manning young, young Jane Manning, is as a rape. And in my book, I'm very careful, as a historian is required to do, to parse out what we can know and what we cannot know about this encounter. I make the point in my book that no, as we know from scholarship around, for example, Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson and other relationships between very powerful white men and um, culturally less powerful 
black women, that no true consent could pass between someone of such high, high power and someone with such a low, low power, right? No, no true consent could pass. Therefore, uh, rape. Therefore, in our contemporary understandings, right, right of, of consent, that would be a rape. I have historical and ethical qualms. Even, I, I, do, I do point out that, again, in our contemporary understandings of, of power and, and, and sex, that this would be considered a rape. But I hedge and haw in some ways, as a historian, in some ways we're required to do, though this is not unproblematic, this hedging and hawing, for two reasons. One is historical. The archive is, is silent in some ways on it. We don't have evidence of what happened, what kind of encounter this was. There's, and the second issue is an ethical one. Jane Manning James worked so hard to exclude this story, this part of her history, from her life sketch, from the way she'd be remembered, right? It, and only do we have it because of Elizabeth J.D. Roundy's intervention. And I would call it a painful intervention that went against Jane Manning James's self-creation, which occurs in narrating a life story. But really, let me go back to the historical issue. Because one of the main points, if not the main takeaways I hope that folks get from my, my book, is that race is created in the archive. By the lim those who have access to the archive get to tell the stories about who is Christian and who is he heathen, who is, who is slave and who is free, who is black, who is white, who is cursed, and who is uh, favored by God. And here I am, ironically, making my, uh, unfortunately making my own point in saying, pushing back slightly, though with great respect and taking seriously these women's critique um, that we can't know, or at least I can't know. I'm making my own point that I'm pointing because the archive is silent, therefore we don't know. Therefore, we don't know to true, her true experience. These women are m teaching me that actually they do know. We can know through, through sources that are perhaps not written through perhaps personal experiences uh, of their own, a of living in America, though it's different from 1830s, it's still America in 2017, where black women, the black body is a site of, uh, of violence uh, often and exclusion. They might, they also perhaps can know, perhaps they're drawing from sources, two kinds of sources that are complementary. In some ways, it's a very black way of stating emphatically, as they have to, towards me and, 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 and critiquing my hedging and hawing, stating emphatically that it's a rape. I think that's a very black way of knowing things. And this is what I mean. The history of being black in America, especially passing through slavery, is a history of erasure. Names, families, country of origin, culture, religion. And that's a erasure of the archive itself. The archive in that sense is racist. The archive, the archive in that sense is, is racist, exactly. It's erased their true history. And so it's an incredible power. There is a great uh, sense of power to state emphatically the, uh, the archive is wrong in its silence. And we are going to, in, in Jane Manning James's voicelessness, we are going to speak for her and uh, use our own voices. That's a very black way of knowing. There, in some ways, it's also about the the story's incomplete without that way. It, it, it's, in, it's incomplete. Yeah, and that's one of the most powerful lessons I've had in this brief time since the book mm. has come out. I've do, learned, do you regret a little bit about how you handled it, or would you? Is this how you would change how you handled it? Is sort of incorporate this kind of idea into the text? Yes, I. You know, looking back, I would have. I, I think I needed to spend more time on directly tackling. I mean, I. I. I give, I think, a very fair account or a very – I spent a lot of time thinking about it, though I don't know. So I'm going to use the word well thought out, though I don't know how good doesn't, to think. Yeah, it doesn't make it good, but <laughs> it, it does mean you good. spend a lot of time thinking but about it. But I did. It, right? I thought carefully about how I would treat this issue. I would have moved the word – just looking at my the paragraph itself, I would have moved the word rape closer to the, this encounter. I, and, and I don't use the word encounter. I use the word relationship. Yeah, sexual relationship uh, that uh, they had. The, uh, they, and and to uh, clarify, later you talk about it in the, terms of rape. Exactly. But, yeah. And I meant to describe sexual relationship as a descriptor, right? Not as a as making any judgment about consent. Right. Though I understand how that reads now mm -hmm. very much. And that's a lesson I take mm -hmm. from it. I would have 
like to, I, looking back, I would have spent more time thinking through the kind of uh, lessons that we can learn outside of the archive from voices that are voices for whom Jane Mayne and James's history is alive. Actually, this text is alive for them, right? This is, this is canonical text for them. And this story is con canon. At the very same time, I'm hoping still I'm doing that now, right? I'm filling it like any text. I'm filling in the, the, the gaps. Um, What's interesting is you do it later. We won't have time to get to this sure. chapter, but the chapter about American Indians, you yeah. talk about when the Latter-day Saints got to Utah, yeah. they didn't get to this empty place that they made blossom as the rose. They came to a great basin where there were between twelve and 35,000 Native Americans living here, and they were interacting with sure. people like Walker, Ch uh, Chief Walker, and, and there's not a lot of records from him because yep. uh, he, he was illiterate, and, and his voice is largely lost to history. Mm -hmm. And so you use ethno-history to yep. sort of imagine what was going on. Mm -hmm. and And having talked to you before the interview, yeah. I now learned that you did that after you had already done all your work on Jane Manning James. Mm -hmm. And so that same kind of approach, which yeah. works really well with Walker, I encourage mm -hmm. people to read the yeah. book and see, you didn't have that tool at your disposal back when you were doing the Jane Manning James stuff. And I don't know even if I would have used it, that, those tools, because it's a partly the siloing, and this is a, a regret, uh, I guess, of the book, or a reflection of it, uh, a siloing of how we treat different kinds of histories, right? We treat African American history because we actually do, because I have a text here. <laughs> it's a problematic text, but I have a text here. So I'm going to treat it as I do other kind of archival work or interpretation. Whereas with Wakara, I don't have texts, uh, but I sort of do. Uh, read the book uh, and you'll see. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and that allows me, in some ways, frees me to. I'm going to use the word imagine. <laughs> yeah, but and I you can, do in the book too. Uh, yeah. Yep, and that's taken from Daniel Richter's understanding that we need to imagine Daniel Richter, the great theorist and historian of, of Indian and settler uh, encounters, his great book, Facing East uh, from Indian Country. We, can, um, we have to imagine events because we don't have, we don't have records for them. And um, anyway, so I do do that work uh, in, in, the, in the Wakara chapter. And yet, you know, this is the book isn't the book is written. <laughs> Hopefully, there'll be a new edition, and I could add some footnotes to these conversations in a new in a new edition. But I'm hoping to, and speaking about it here, and and speaking about it tonight, and hopefully writing more formally about this in a journal article, that I can begin to fill in the gaps mm -hmm. in my own work here. And so I've you know I, learning so much from the reaction to it, especially the critiques of the book, because I said, as I said to these women and to others, and I've written uh, about it, my first audience for this book, because I'm a non Mormon white guy, I am very, very sensitive to the issues of cultural appropriation here. These are not my stories. These are not my stories because I don't share the faith. These are not my stories because I don't share the cultural experience of, of being black in America. I love Jane, Man Jane Manning James. I'll say that. I, I think she's an amazing, has an amazing story um, and, can, and can teach not only Mormons, but uh, all Americans about the very complicated history of race and religion. Th she belongs to her spiritual descendants, um, especially black Mormon women. And so for the, the, I take very much to heart. And as I shared during the, a brown bag lunch, uh, even to the heart, to the point of tears when I talk about it, that uh, I, I, my, my first audience is, is them, is, is the people who are direct descendants of Jane Manning James, like Lewis Duffy, her, um, Jane Manning James's great, great, great grandson. I think maybe I added a great there. I think it was just great, great grandson who helped me secure Jane Manning James's patriarchal blessing so I can analyze it. And her spiritual descendants, like, like the sisters of Zion, Tamu and Zandra, Jury Harwell, and 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 folks in the Genesis group, and also non-white Mormons around the world, to who can look to Jane Manning James, it's his story, in a church that is today most majority non-American, and likely majority non-white, and they can look to this her story and see that actually non-white people have always been part of this church. And so they can look to that history and find continuity and that the aberration was this period in time between 1849, 1850 and 1978, when, pe when people of African descent in particular were excluded. And they can look and find continuity instead of 
which is so very important for this church. That's Max Perry Mueller. He's assistant professor of religious studies at the University of Nebraska. And today we talked about his new book, Race and the Making of the Mormon People. There's so much more that we could talk about. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But Max, I want to say thank you for being on the show today. Thank you, Blair. It's been an absolute pleasure. And you all are doing wonderful work with this podcast. And I, I'm a fan, big fan. <laughs> well, hey, I appreciate that. And I, I really do encourage people to pick up a copy of this book. And you'll be able to find uh, more stuff from Max out there. He's doing interviews with different outlets. Well, yeah, one can, if you're interested more in learning about the book itself, uh, I encourage you to buy the book at the at the University of North Carolina Press and not that everything store on the internet, if, pos- if at all possible. I know it's more convenient, but the press gets more money that way. And it's a nonprofit organization. So they very much appreciate the direct kind of contribution. I also say I have a blog, I don't believe it, or, or a website now, maxperrymuller.com, where I'm uh, doing my best to update the goings on of the kind of mini book tour and the reception of the book. And also I'm update, you know, I'm also chronicling the new projects, which, which are actually related to, very much to this new project I'm looking at. Uh, doing a, a material cultural history of Wakara, one of the main figures in, in, in the book. Thanks, Max. Thank you, sir. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Here's a recent review of the show from Elena B. She says, as a mother of four young and active children, these podcasts are a thrilling change of pace for me. They break me out of my normal routines and stale ways of thinking. I listen to them while I'm doing dishes or making dinner or going on my morning runs. Every time I listen, my mind is taken to new places and I see the world around me differently. These podcasts effectively provide both spiritual and intellectual nourishment. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you, Elena B. Always glad to accompany people on a morning run. Let's get some reviews from more runners. We have a few reviews already, but I feel like there have to be more of you out there. So if you're a runner, go to iTunes and review the show. Let us know when you listen. And we'll see you next time on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you.